Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 401 Written by Pepper Antique When James woke up he thought it was a normal morning. The first hint that something was wrong was when he went to brace his hand on the nightstand to get up out of bad and almost fell on his face. He managed to catch himself at the last second, but when he did he realized what the issue was. His arm was almost four inches shorter. And human again. N.N. No. A voice said from somewhere behind him. Tea time. James spun to look at the source, realizing what was going on. But nobody was there. He looked up now that he was outside of their bed's canopy, and sure enough was looking up at some kind of galaxy ceiling like he had the previous times this had happened. Someone that looked like a strange mashup of a candy striper nurse and a gladiator appeared as they slammed into the bedpost with a hand. Asts like schnozberries. They yelled manically before blinking out of existence again. The bed shook as if it had been hit by a sledgehammer and James looked down as he suddenly worried that it might wake Amina. But the other side of the bed was empty. Of course it was. This was for him. Which one of you is this? He asked as he stood up and looked around. Defiance. He spun as he heard someone stumble into one of the armor stands in the corner. DD, NT where it TTTT dash, a short Japanese zero pilot said before seeming to freeze in place. Then suddenly they were sitting down as if relaxing in a chair. This was despite no chair being visible. They also looked like they were about to bite into something even though their hand was empty. Oh oh you oot. They said before freezing with a mischievous grin and disappearing again. Yeah. That was definitely defiance. What do you want? James asked the heir. Joseph Choi. A woman's voice said from everywhere at once. James felt the hair on the back of his neck stand up on end at the sound of his brother's voice. You, have a defiant soul. Joey. James yelled as he began looking around frantically. Why would they mention his brother unless he was here? Joe Joe. But there was nobody there. At least not until someone appeared before slamming into one of the walls while looking the other direction. The room shook from the impact, and even the galaxy like ceiling somehow released a bit of dust, despite none being visible. This time they were wearing what looked like a straight jacket made of black leather with buckles and fasteners that seemed to glow with blue light, their arms were wrapped and secured around them. James thought he recognized the form as they wound back to make another run at the wall. It's my damn purpose. They yelled up above them as they charged the wall again, and as James tried to get a look at their face, he thought he saw his dad's favorite baseball hat on their head. I'm just DOI dash, they began right before impact. James braced himself for another room shaking slam. But instead they disappeared again, right as their shoulder would have hit. Suddenly James felt himself being grabbed and spun forcefully by strong hands and arms. Too many of them for the person he saw as he jumped back and away from them. Suddenly a caveman of some kind was shaking James by his shoulders. No TT time. The caveman yelled in a startlingly British accent. The stutter came with a facial tick that looked almost like a video buffering between two frames. There's a reason I like the guy. A voice that James immediately recognized from the worst day of his life said a split second after the caveman disappeared, leaving James braced against his dresser. James. James turned and saw, of all people, General Crick. His eyes widened as he saw that the general was on the ground, and his lower body seemed to be fused into the wall. He was clawing at the ground with one hand, and the other was gripping one of the stones in the floor that James had a habit of tripping on. Something unseen was pulling him through the wall. The wall which James now realized was rippling as if it was made of water. James also saw what looked like several bullet exit wounds on the general's back, and his throat was blown out. It's... The general struggled to say as he was wrenched back, extending the gripping arm out to its full length. Coming. He said as he lost his grip and was pulled through the wall fully. Was that actually the general somehow? Or was that just defiance taking another visage from someone? What is? He asked the empty room, getting angry now. What's coming you piece of shit god? And before he even finished the sentence he was launching up from their bed in a cold sweat. James? Amina asked with concern as she gripped his shoulders, causing him to jump. 
it's just a dream dear. She assured him as she sat up all the way and tried to comfort him. But as he looked around the room frantically, breathing heavily as he tried to figure out if he was actually awake now, he knew inside that it hadn't been. And he thought he also knew what the deity had been speaking of. Despite what people might have expected, Driscoll was actually enjoying the downtime now that the agency had seemingly been repelled. For the first time in decades he felt like he had no true obligations. He went to PT in the morning with the rest of the military personnel, though it was obvious that none of them knew what to do with him. Also their PT couldn't even come close to tiring him out now. He also went to the training that Choi had mandated for both him and Five. Plus range and tactics familiarization training that Vickers usually just sent to their goggles now that he was undergoing his own training. He was actually sitting in on that training as he thought. Vickers hadn't minded, and Vickers' instructor Vardran hadn't seemed to care at all. So he was currently sitting off to the side as Vardran sat wreathed in fire, and Vickers sat opposite of the large man while focusing on matching him. It was kind of amusing to Driscoll how frustrated the seal seemed to be at failing to summon any flames. What was even more interesting was the odd sensations that the two of them were causing him to feel in the very air around him. He knew that he and Five, as well as all the other Earth personnel besides Choi, Vickers, Werner, and Batista, were forbidden from learning magic. At least not until they'd earned a bit more trust and were released from the magical bands that still rested on his ankles. But the fact that he could even sense those energies was alarming to him. Not in a bad way. But it was interesting to him that he could sense things moving around in the world around him that he couldn't see. He could feel the heat baking off of Vardran, despite the fact that the warrior left not even so much as a light scorch mark when he left his seated position. But he could also feel energy flowing out of himself and the air around him, and into the seated fire-wielding warrior. He could feel that same flow moving towards Vickers, though it was weaker and seemed to cut in and out as the chief struggled. Driscoll wondered what things would be like when he learned magic himself. Choi, despite being young and somewhat immature, was a lot stronger in this world than Driscoll had realized. He'd seen the young Mustang moving like some kind of discount flash. Had seen him fly with explosions like some kind of bullet. Saw the way the princess, king, and even the common people of this world looked up to him. Even the colonel seemed to treat him with a sort of begrudging respect. Vickers was a powerhouse. An incredibly strong and mobile warfolk that put both Driscoll and Five to shame regardless of skill level, and familiarity with their new forms. He was also incredibly strong in his brand of ice magic, and with Vardran's help would become even stronger, and gain access to more than just ice. Even people Driscoll didn't think of as warriors were strong in this world. Batista, more of a cyborg than the two muck marchers at this point, was at the epitome of what combining standard earth human fitness with Petaravian magical saturation. He had outscored the military personnel on almost every event the day prior, and had petitioned Choi for a four-day pass and city visit. Choi had shut him down by reminding him that he was no longer active duty, and could also visit the city freely. Choi's mother, who wasn't military at all, was apparently an accomplished healer here in the castle. Even though she'd only gained the magic months prior she was held in high enough regard in the healing ward that when she spoke, even the lead healers listened to her. This was aided by her earth-based medical knowledge. But it still counted. Without the agency to actively hunt now, Driscoll wondered what his path was. Even Five had found a path of sorts. She was likely challenging the centaur who had become her obsession, he thought maybe even to an unhealthy level, as he sat here. He'd watched their last bout and was honestly impressed at how good Five was getting at fighting. Even if it was obvious that Gorna was still barely even trying during the matches. Eventually, the worst squirrel would either succeed and gain herself a girlfriend of sorts, or fail enough times that she gave up. And Driscoll knew her well enough to know which one was more likely. But what would he, Driscoll, do now that he had no true direction? He suspected that that very question was why Vickers had had no issue with him sitting in on today's session. He knew the seal, and likely five as well, had noticed how listless he had been the past few weeks. He pondered the discussion he and Dr. Shaw had had shortly after his transformation. The realization that he had been the last of his team to wonder if they were even worth being treated as people instead of as weapons. He thought of how even Choi had told him that they always had a choice in their actions. 
even if it wasn't always a pleasant one. Driscoll had no idea which way to go now. And unless the agency decided to rear its ugly head again, he doubted he was even needed here anymore. Hey chief? He asked before he even realized he was speaking. The two elemental warriors looked over at him curiously. He felt the energy around Vickers stutter for a moment and almost felt bad. Vickers raised an eyebrow in obvious frustration at the interruption. Sorry. He said. Just, you mind if I go into the city for a bit? Take a walk. He asked. Vickers looked at him with less anger than confusion for a moment. Then shrugged. Sure. The seal said as he turned back to Vardran and took a deep breath. Just let Choi and Werner know and grab a couple of the pay marks from the office for lunch or whatever. Be back before night or I come and get you. Got it. He said as he stood up. Sorry for interrupting. It's fine. Vardran said. Distractions are a part of all life. Even this. Driscoll nodded as he walked out the door. He wondered if the strange man knew just how accurately he'd described what the Werfox now felt like. Yep. He said as he began walking down the hall. That's me. Driscoll, former cyborg super soldier, current fox guy. He sighed as his shoulders slumped. Big Ole distraction from all the important stuff going on. And in the training room he'd just left, Vickers' ear perked up as it caught what he knew wasn't meant to be heard by anyone else. Driscoll headed toward the ambassadorial suite to check out for the day. Samantha and the others knelt behind whatever cover they could as they looked out at the interesting sight. They'd followed the trail for almost 20 miles before getting here. Lieutenant Marks, who was the Canadian soldier accompanying Goko, had been the one to alert them that something was up. She was the one in the group whose job was to detect any unexpected surveillance or trap systems as they moved. Over her iPro, she had an attachment that could be used to detect camera and sensor fields such as infrared lasers, or other monitoring equipment. She'd spotted, and confirmed with her wrist tablet, a sensor of some kind set on the side of a small cliff face that ran parallel to the trail they'd been following some 200 meters ahead. The ten of them had spread out slowly, working with the lieutenant as she used the body cameras of the others to augment her own sensor suite. They detected four more surveillance devices, including two cameras, and worked very carefully to avoid being spotted. This made the wolves' job much harder as the scent trail and tracks seemed to point right at the side of the cliff. Command. Marx chimed in now that they were behind some bushes and fallen trees with Chevrolet looking at the cliff with the scope of his rifle. How's the area look? Arquette answered quickly. We're seeing it. She said through their earpieces. Chevy we're seeing the heat signature on your cam too. Additional heat signatures are being confirmed at roughly half a kilometer to your northeast, and another roughly the same but dead north. There was a pause before she spoke again. Our techs think they're vents. But if they are then they've been well disguised. Look like bear dens or something on the UAV feed. We'll need our teams to confirm if they can. Definitely a hidden door. Chevrolet said. Can see the seams around the edge. Cold. But not as cold as the rest of the stone. Samantha looked around at her fellow wolves. They each nodded at her. They'd all been following the same scent as they moved carefully around the perimeter of the camera sensor field. All noses point at the cliff. She said to Chevrolet, who simply nodded. Copy that. Arquette replied. Rear teams are moving forward now. Marks have your team hunker down for now. Jenkins you and your team can fall back once you link up with the rear teams. She nodded. Unless something unexpected happened their job here was done. Now they just needed to see what they'd found. 